answer is yes, because we know the organism from which a nose ode is prepared will cause, in a healthy person, symptoms that are similar to the symptoms that need to be prevented. I mean, that's blindly obvious. Therefore, they must be a match uh, in terms of the principle of similars. And finally, Indians were the most and Australians were the least satisfied with their initial training. Now, this I found fascinating. And then I, on reflection, it sort of makes sense because in India, you know, you're using remedies for dengue, for Japanese encephalitis, etc., 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 all the time. So you have a, a very high awareness of this. And I would assume that this translates through to your teaching. Uh, well, it certainly seems like it from that, although, once again, the sample of Indian physicians was very, very small. Australia has amongst the highest use of HP per head of population in the world, but they're the most dissatisfied practitioners with their training in the orthodox colleges. It's a bit of a conundrum. But anyway, we'll see if we can get that uh, research study going. It's a very simple study to do, and uh, we'll see where it leads from there. But to me, missed opportunities are seen in things like swine flu in 2010 and the Zika virus, because I truly believe internationally that homeopathy has something to offer, even if it's only filling the gap, which often lasts two or three years, between the identification of a major outbreak and the development of a vaccine. Now, it was interesting with the swine flu. The American government spent $4 billion both researching and then developing a swine flu vaccine. Australia spent $200 million buying uh, 20 million doses, most of which were unused. Australia could have been covered for $10,000 using homeoprophylaxis. So it doesn't make sense in a way. We have this wonderful thing in homeopathy, the ability to offer a significant level of prevention without risk to the recipient and at a very, very affordable cost. But why aren't governments taking it up? And this comes back to the topic that Dr. Manchandra gave me. There obviously are problems with the research that we're showing to the world. We may not be showing it effectively and the quality of the research may not be sufficient. But as I said earlier, the numbers are there. We have the data. There's a gap. And I won't get into conspiracy theories about Big Pharma, I promise. OK, so the main challenge for HP research is how do we demonstrate to governments through appropriate research that HP is a safe and effective method of infectious disease prevention, which, because most Western, I'll put that in brackets, but. Uh, I know some of your politicians don't, uh, are not like this, because most Western politicians take their advice from allopaths, leads to the question, how do we demonstrate to orthodox scientists and medical professionals that HP is a safe and effective option, which in turn requires us to ask, how can we improve all aspects of HP research, planning, execution, analysis, publication and promotion? Now, I'm going to focus on points one and five, because I know that you've got people here who are very well skilled in executing or delivering a program. You've got eminent statisticians here who can analyze the data. You've got people here who can write up reports. Uh, and promotion is another issue. So mainly, I'm gonna talk about planning and very briefly, promotion. So planning, what is the best type of research? Now, I don't disagree with Dr. Manchandra when he says it's essential that we do high quality randomized controlled trials. But I am also maybe somewhat at odds because to me, very often, when you're researching natural medicine in general, using RCTs is, I, I hope the, the expression is familiar here, trying to put a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't always fit. And remember, uh, we can look at an article by Professor John Ioannidis back in 2005 whose title was, Why Are Most Research Findings False? And he was talking about allopathic medicine. It caused a huge spur, stir in the allopathic community. And I'd highly recommend him to you. You'll see a reference to him in the uh, notes that I provided. 
because he's highly respected in orthodox circles, but yet he regularly, with his colleagues, shows and demonstrates how systematic reviews based on randomised controlled trials can produce extremely misleading information. So we have to make sure that whatever we do is the best method for what we are doing, not just there to satisfy the orthodox community. I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, but as you'll see in a moment, what I'm suggesting is what a lot of people are talking about now in the orthodox medical literature, that reliability on one type of study alone is not good enough. We need a comprehensive range of studies. Now, Dr. Alejandro Jadad, who, after whom the Jadad score was uh, named, that's a quality score for assessing randomised controlled trials, he saw randomization, control, and follow-up as being three crucial things in studies. Now, randomization is often not possible or not relevant in homeoprophylaxis studies. I mean, if you've got an epidemic moving through an area, are you going to say to the people you want to protect, well, some of you will give protection and some of you will give a placebo? I mean, if you put it to a, an orthodox ethics committee, they'd deny you permission to do that for very good reason. There are also situations where, um, and I'm thinking particularly of the Cuban situation, where the people doing the um, intervention are directed by their government, uh, particularly in the swine flu case, and I'll show you something in a moment about that, where they, the government said, protect everyone in the community above 12 months of age, and that was an instruction. So we're dealing very often in HP with practical interventions, not academic studies. Control, on the, other way, on the other hand, is something that we can try and do better, to try and have a control group. And I've identified three possibilities here. Firstly, direct control, and an example of this is the meningococcal type B intervention by Mroninsky and others in Brazil, 1998. 65, almost 66,000 used HP, 23,500 no HP. Now, it wasn't randomised, but they had a perfect control because the, the two groups were living in the same community. They followed the, the participants on both groups for 12 months. The efficacy of homeoprophylaxis in this um, controlled study, not randomised, was 91% after 12 months. You won't get any better than that with a vaccine. There can be indirect controls. For example, the Cuban intervention against leptospirosis in 2007, 2008, which really set a lot of people around the world talking about homeoprophylaxis. So you can see here, um, I haven't got a pointer, unfortunately, but you can see here the data from 2007, 2008. And the study that was published in homeopathy only related to the 2007 intervention. In fact, the 2008 intervention was an overwhelming success. The control here was the dark, unbroken line, which was the rest of the country. So the uh, leptospirosis intervention, we call it IR, the intervened region, was in three provinces on the east of Cuba, and we used the rest of the country as a control. It was an imperfect control. It, that's why I call it an indirect control, but it was better than nothing. And when you look at 2008, I haven't got a pointer, unfortunately, but the one on the right, you can see that in the rest of the country, the dotted line, there was a massive spike. It, no, it's okay. There was a massive spike in leptospirosis cases, whereas in the intervene region, the dark line at the bottom, there were hardly any cases at all. Now, this was despite the fact that the intervene region, the east of Cuba, is always the worst hit by hurricanes. The amount of damage by, done by the hurricanes in 2008 on the eastern side was massive. And in fact, I first visited Cuba at their invitation in December 2008, and their food production for the whole country was only just coming back to normal. The government had directed people in the rest of the country to plant quick-growing vegetables in their backyards to help out the people on the east because the devastation was immense. And that's when the leptospirosis is most likely to spread. But you look at the success of that. 
It's absolutely unambiguous. Um, I've given an example of my own study, my long-term study, where I used an indirect control. So in the uh, first column, you can see the attack rate, which is the... Um, this is the normal rate that people f who have never been exposed to the disease and have never been immunised, if you had 100 people in the room and someone came in with active pertussis, coughed over everyone evenly, 85% would get pertussis and 15% wouldn't. That's what we mean by the national attack rate. The attack rate for those using long-term homeoprophylaxis was 11.7%. With measles, the national attack rate, 90%. The attack rate under HP, 9%. With mumps, the national attack rate was 70%. Under HP, it was 5.9%. And so that enabled a standard calculation of the effectiveness for those three diseases. They were the only ones where there were recorded failures in my long-term study, which went from 1986 to 2002. So that's another example of an indirect control. So we have the opportunity to do that. Um, there was a little example there of a fall factor uh, in a dengue outbreak in Brazil. No control possible, and as I mentioned before, this was in 2010, when the Cuban government directed the Finlay Institute to immunise the whole country over 12 months of age against swine flu. Now, there were hardly any cases. So when Dr. Bracho and I were crunching the numbers, we couldn't come to any conclusion about how effective HP was against swine flu because we didn't know how many people brought swine flu into Cuba. The fact that there were so few cases uh, suggested it was effective, but it didn't prove it. However, the Cubans love mixing things together. So at the same time they did the swine flu intervention, they also added into the remedy um, that they uh, dispensed 9.8 million doses across the country, a remedy for pneumococcal disease. And you can see there in 2010 the fall in deaths from influenza and pneumococcal disease. That's influenza in general, not swine flu and it rose again in the following year. So sometimes controls aren't possible. With your amazing Japanese encephalitis interventions in uh, 99, 2000 and 2001 in the old Andhra Pradesh, the indirect control would be looking at the changes in Japanese encephalitis figures in states immediately surrounding Andhra Pradesh and we're trying to get data for that. Hopefully we can. It already is very impressive when you look at most other states where we've been able to get some data. Uh, it shows that the, the level didn't suddenly fall because obviously if the level fell in the states surrounding Andhra Pradesh as well as in Andhra Pradesh itself, which they fell to zero, uh, then that would mean that you could not draw the same conclusions from the study. So controls are possible direct or indirect. Follow-up should be possible. Moroninsky followed up for 12 months. In my study, I followed up for six years. Now, this is where, uh, this is a, a little chart from Professor Harold Wallach, who I have a high regard from, uh, and he's just showing that we need to look at a whole range of evidence, not just one thing. So RCTs are in there, appropriately. They should be, but they're not the be-all and end-all. So we need observational and cohort studies most of what we're going to do with HP epidemic research will be observational and cohort. But that means we need to make those studies as rigorous and as acceptable to a scientific community as possible. Now, in the handout that's coming tomorrow, you'll see some options that people have suggested to improve observational and cohort studies, Bradford Hill's criteria, the CASP checklist, and you'll see the reference there that will be in the handout. That's really worth looking at. They have a great range of suggestions about how to improve studies, a seven-step checklist for observational research. We also need to look at bias and confounders. I'll just have to go through this very quickly. The other thing before I get on to the main part of my talk, which only takes, fortunately, about five minutes, so don't worry, Robert. The 
other thing we need to be careful about is not only do we really need to have well-constructed studies statistically, but if they don't, if they're not using appropriate remedies and potencies and frequency of doses, they can be doomed to fail. So one of the things I'm working on here is a little chart, and I'll be happy to share, if appropriate, uh, in the next few days, um, where we bring three factors in, the likelihood of exposure, the severity of the disease, and the intensity of exposure. So you can have exposure which may be unlikely, but if it happens, it can be very intense. You can also have exposure which is highly likely, but it's not intense. And that gives us, I'm just trying to put together something which will give us uh, some sort of a template on which to choose potency and frequency. So that's all work in progress. Okay, so the next step is to try and produce something which will improve research into homeoprophylaxis. And what I worked on after getting uh, the topic was to try and develop a checklist that can be used both before and after research by the researchers to try and ensure not only uniformity in the way the research is progressed, but to ensure that as many things like bias and confounders are appropriately dealt with and ensure that the research that's going to be done has a good chance of success. So, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. I don't expect anyone to remember it. This is a first version, if you like. It's a suggestion which uh, we may work on in my next few days in um, India, if appropriate. So in other words, basically, you've got the items as a yes, no, not applicable, or don't know. And most boxes will be ticked, although there'll be a few that won't. So we've got the title of the study, objectives. Are they clear and focused on an achievable outcome? State the general research methods. Then is it randomised? Is it blinded? Is it controlled? Is there follow-up? If a sample is used in follow-up, was it randomised? Is the study prospective? Is the method being tested established within home in homeopathy and with homeoprophylaxis, of course it is? What's the, uh, the, the pre-study odds of positive effect? What's the effect size of the medicine? So when I say 90%, a lot of short-term and my long-term studies showed an average effectiveness of HP of around 90%. That's what we mean by the effect size. The sample size, state the projected sample size. Is it adequate? Is there a power calculation? Then we look at biases, selection bias, detection bias, observer bias, recall, response, confirmation bias, analysis bias, publication bias, and follow-up bias. I tell you what, the NHNMRC wouldn't have ticked many of the yes boxes uh, if you applied this to, uh, to their study. So all of these things we should look at before and after the research project because there may be a yes, a tick in the yes box before the study starts. Is there also a tick after the study has been concluded? Then we should also enumerate confounders, list the statistical methods, and then after the completion of the study, as well as repeating what was above, the results, the effectiveness, the confidence limits, are they adequate? How do the results compare with other comparable evidence? Do they reveal a dose um, positive response? Bradford Hill was very strong on this point. In other words, the more you give, the better it should add. Do we find that in the result? Is the method biologically plausible? That's an interesting one with uh, homeopathy, of course, in general. And can the results be translated into clinical practice? So this is the suggestion I brought to the conference today as one possible way of trying to improve the rigour of research into disease prevention. Then we come to promoting the results. And I'm not going to talk very uh, much on this at all, but we need to make sure that when we get results, they're promoted well to politicians and to orthodox people. Now, I might just go over these bits. In summary, we have sufficient data, actual and potential. We must strive to improve the quality and consistency of the data. Most projects will be practical interventions when we're talking about HP as opposed to treatment. 
analysed using observational studies that rather than randomised controlled trials. They're not impossible to do, but there are ethical considerations. Improve quality using pre- and post-trial checklists. We need to look at research looking at vaccinated versus unvaccinated children because that's the only way we can do an effective cost-benefit study of both vaccination and homeopathic immunisation. And we need to publish and promote the results. It is possible if we have the will to do it. Finally, I'd like to finish with a, a quote from Dear Hunneman again. And you all know that he wasn't diplomatic. He used to speak very bluntly to people. So this is one of his more blunt...